Hello again, and welcome to the Parsha class from the Temple Institute. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and again, despite everything that's going on in the world right now, I am quite excited to be here for this class. And uh, I made it here in spite of the general shutdown that's going on in Jerusalem and in Israel, like much, much of the world. And we live in interesting times. Uh, in, here in Israel, like a good deal of the world, we're in a sort of general shutdown of everything. A Every, good deal of the stores are closed, restaurants and, and all kinds of places are closed. There's nobody on the street like there usually is. And everybody has been told to stay in their houses unless absolutely necessary, only for essential things. It's, it's a warning that sounds almost biblical in its severity. But here I am. Uh, in a, a studio, of so, studio of sorts to give this class because I consider serious discussion of the Parsha to be pretty essential. So with that as an intro, let's get started. So it happens to be that this week, the Parsha is the relatively rare event of a double Parsha. So um, this, these things only come out uh, owing to the nuances of the Jewish calendar and when the holidays, what day of the week the holidays happen to come out on. These two Parshas this week happen to frequently be a double Parsha because they deal with the same subject, that of the construction of the tabernacle in the desert. So for those who are big tabernacle fans, these Parshas are absolute gold and that's why the Temple Institute makes a big deal out of things like this. Uh, even though there's a lot of copious details and, and uh, a lot of lists and things like that, but they are exciting for people who are big on the tabernacle. It happens that this week there's a third Parsha, believe it or not, that is read specifically this time of year. And this is called, the Hebrew uh, phrase for this is Parshat Achodesh, which means the Parsha dealing with the new month, which the very first verse in this, in this section, is a relatively short section, the very first verse in this section is a commandment to commemorate the new month, a specific new month, the first month of the Jewish calendar, which is now called, in Hebrew it's called the month of Nisan, which roughly corresponds to April. So why is this month different from all other months in that it uh, has this specific commemoration? It's because this month, the month of Nisan, has the holiday of Pesach or Passover in it. And that's really what this section is all about. It's the section on the Shabbat immediately preceding the, the new month of Nisan because in the month of Nisan the holiday of Passover is coming and we have to read this section to know what Passover is all about. Now we are going to explore in this class two specific issues dealing with this section. Uh, one is what exactly the word Pesach means, which it's always translated as Passover. We're going to find out what exactly it does mean, and it is Passover really the translation of this phrase. And the second is these mysterious and puzzling uh, forces of destruction that come up in a verse, a verse or two in the section. So with that in mind, uh, we need some background as to what's going on here. So uh, the section deals with uh, the night of Passover, which was also the night of the tenth of the ten plagues that had struck, struck Egypt for a good deal of the previous year. So these plagues were of varying severity, there were nine of them, and in spite of all this, this divine retribution, the Egyptians and Pharaoh still refused to release the Israelites from slavery. This particular plague, which is the killing of the firstborn on this particular, particular night, was announced by Moshe to Pharaoh and Pharaoh still refused to let them go. So this was all really part of the divine plan that Pharaoh would refuse, and it was all part of this great moment, the most, mom the most momentous moment in the history of the Israelites, and in the, in the most momentous moment in the Bible, one of the key moments in Judaism, and one of the famous events in the history of the world, the Exodus. This night is the immediate preceding events to the Exodus. So the rest of the section deals with what the Israelites were supposed to be doing on this night. So what were they doing while these destructive forces or the killing of the firstborn or this plague was going on? What were they supposed to be doing? So we are told that in addition to commemorating the new month at the beginning of this month, four days before Passover, they had to reserve a lamb or goat to slaughter, to eat a, 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 as, as a meal, as a, a ritual meal on this night. So the, the, the lamb had to be um, selected and they had to decide where and with whom they were eating, going to eat the meal. And then there are all kinds of verses dealing with how to prepare the food. 
It had to be slaughtered in a, in a very specific way on the night that we call pre preceding Passover, Passover Eve, which is really, according to the Bible, the day of Pesach itself, when they slaughter it. In addition, the matzah had to be baked on that day, or perhaps uh, on the night following this. And the, the meat was slaughtered, roasted in a very specific manner, and two other foods were prepared, the matzah and the bitter herbs. So this were, were really the central features of the Passover meal, which stands a, uh, a good chance of being the longest continuous running ritual in the history of the world. It's been running for, a, for more than 3,000 years, even though it's changed a good deal over those 3,000 years, but it's more or less, to some degree or another, it's the same thing. It commemorates the Exodus, which this first night in Egypt was the actual Exodus itself, and all other subsequent Passovers or Pesachs are really just a commemoration of that original night. So the, the three key foods are the lamb or goat, the, what's called the Pesach, and then there's the bitter herbs, which commemorates the slavery, that the, the bitterness of slavery the Israelites went through. And then there's the matzah, which is the unleavened bread, which really represents the fact that we have to cut away all the baloney in life and all the luxury and the charade of everything that goes on and just get down to the core of what's really important in life. With these three things, the Pesach, the Matzah, and the Morar, that defines what the Passover meal is all about. For the last 2,000 years, there has been no animal associated. There's no, there was no uh, slaughtering of an animal to be eaten here. And it's just the Matzah and the bitter herbs but the absence of the animal, of the meat that's eaten, is almost as important as, important as its presence was in biblical times. So, with that in mind, we have to go on to what else comes up in this section. So there's a series of commandments. They're all told there's maybe a dozen or so commandments in this little section. So there's a series of commandments dealing with where the Israelites have to be and what they have to do in that location. So they are commanded specifically to not leave the house that they're in all night long. They're also commanded to take some of the blood from the animal that they slaughtered and, and, uh, and smear it on the doorposts of the house so God can see it and know not, to, know to not have this plague strike there. There is another set of commandments uh, that were actually limited to this very first Passover and they're no this first Pesach and they're no longer done. And these deal with the restriction of not setting foot outside of the house where the meal was eaten all night long. Also, blood had to be placed, blood from the, the slaughtered animal had to be placed on the doorposts of the house. And the third thing was everybody had to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. This was, after all, the Exodus, and it had to be eaten in a state of preparedness. The Exodus, everybody had to be ready for it. So the reason for the commandment of not leaving the house is stated explicitly in the Torah. It was to avoid any collateral damage to the Israelites while the plague was raging among the Egyptians. The key verse reads, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and I will see the blood and pass over you, and there shall not be upon you a plague of destruction when I strike the land of Egypt. There are two words in that verse that are of questionable translation. The first is a variation of the word Pesach, which is always translated as Passover, and it's actually a future tense use of that word, which means I will, was always translated as I will pass over. But there's a problem with this translation. The problem is that in the immediate preceding verse, there's a completely different word that also means Passover, and it's a much more common uh, word for Passover. So why is there a completely different word for the same meaning for Passover in the very next sentence? This is a problem with the standard, virtually universal translation of Pesach as Passover. So many people, most uh, people who interpret these sort of things have no problem with this. They say, okay, there's two words that mean the same thing. It's not so terrible. It happens all the time in the Bible. So this is just one more time. But for those who are not satisfied with this, this explanation, it happens there are two alternatives. One is something that uh, has a great rabbinic authority behind it, including the original rabbinic translation of the Torah. And believe it or not, they translate this word Pesach, or this variation of the word Pesach, as pity. In other words, God is saying not that I will pass over you, but that I will pity you and there shall not be a plague of destruction upon you. While this is a surprising translation, again, it has a great deal of authority backing it up. 
It happens that there's a third uh, possible explanation or translation of this word, which is very rare, and most Jews are not aware that this explanation even exists. But uh, owing to actual Hebrew grammar, it's probably the most likely translation. And this is a word which is very surprising and hard to imagine. It's the word for limp or stumble or something like that. And it refers to an identical word. It's an identical spelling later on in the Torah, which refers to a lame person. So what could this possibly mean? What does limp or stumble or lame have to do with Passover? I will be lame? So it turns out that this is actually how some people interpret this phrase. I will be like sort of lame or weak. I will display weakness, not my normal divine power, and uh, spare you from this plague. Spare you from the divine wrath associated with this, the forces of destruction that are going on. So with that, we can come to the second questionable phrase in that verse. And that deals with this plague of destruction uh, that would not strike the Israelites as long as they remained indoors. So what is this plague of destruction? So the standard explanation, which almost everybody agrees with, is it's simply destruction, the plague of the firstborn that was going on outside. And there was no weird forces going on. It was simply God out there, no help from angels of destruction or any other forces of destruction. It's simply the plague that was going on would not strike them. Okay, that's fine, but it, the, the actual word in Hebrew does not really um, uh, support this interpretation. The word is hamashchit or lamashchit, which means the destroyer. It doesn't really mean destruction, it means the destroyer. So what could this destroyer possibly be? So, um, so the, uh, some of the uh, commentaries back there actually explain this as angels of destruction. Now, what were these angels of destruction? Were they under the guidance of God or were they sort of freelancers that were independent of God? So Judaism is extremely reluctant to have any other forces out there that are totally independent of God. But nevertheless, they want to see this mashchit thing, this destroyer, as somehow something different from God. So if it's not independent of God, then what exactly is it? So the truth is, it's not really clear and Jewish uh, authorities, rabbinic views, are actually divided on this very issue. The classic explanation, again, is it's simply the destruction that was going on out there. This is supported in the Haggadah story that's told on Pesach night in Jewish homes all around the world and has been for the past couple thousand years. Okay, no problem with that. But if you go with the other explanation that it's some sort of destroyer force that's out there, what could this possibly be? So, to explain this as perhaps something other than simply angels of destruction, it happens to be that for better or for worse, human beings are very familiar, familiar with catastrophes and disasters and destruction. And we all know that this is something we can never really escape from. It's probably going to be with us forever. We know that catastrophe happens. It's an earthquake. It's a war. It's a famine. It's a plague. Whatever it might be. It's bad. It's catastrophic. People die, and that's the way things are. But there's something else that happens in the course of these catastrophes that sometimes is even more destructive. And this perhaps is this, this destroyer force. That is the chaos and the panic and the confusion and the collateral damage that happens as a result of these disasters and catastrophes. The Israelites were told that they would be spared that. Either God would pass over them and not subject them to it, or God would pity them and not subject them to them, or God would be weak and not subject them to it, subject them to it. But in any case, the chaos, the panic, the confusion somehow would miss them and that sense that all hell is breaking loose when one of these disaster strikes would not hit them. The Israelites would sense that this force was out there, but somehow they were being spared the full, full brunt of the, of the power, of the destructive power. It happens to be that much of the world today faces such a force of destruction literally at this very moment. And perhaps it's helpful to reflect on the message of this particular section here. Disaster and, and catastrophe and destruction are something that always accompanies us wherever we go. There's no way to avoid it. That much is clear. Okay, we can avoid the sense of chaos and panic that almost invariably accompanies that sense of catastrophe. This is something that which we do indeed have the power to prevent. Whether that means staying indoors and not confronting the plague, or whether it means 
uh, uh, fighting the urge to panic and despair over what is happening, or whether it means simply acknowledging and recognizing God's presence in our lives and the fact that we are fortunate despite whatever is happening. We have a certain amount of control over the events that are happening around us. The, the force, the true force of destruction is the chaos and the panic. It may not come from God, but it comes from us. It is our task when faced with calamity and disaster to maintain a sense of composure with the confident knowledge that this too shall pass over. Shabbat Shalom.